Welcome to episode three of the Unpacking Alpha podcast. I'm Sebastian Lander, Portfolio Manager at Pack Capital. And I'm Camilla Goldingate, the Business Development Manager at Pack Capital. And we're very lucky today to welcome Richard Quinn from Bentham to the Unpacking Alpha podcast. Thanks, Seb. Uh, a pleasure to be here. Our pleasure. So with that, we'll kick into the questions. Um, so right. tell, tell us, who are Bentham Asset Management? Right. Um, Bentham Asset Management is a global fixed income and credit investor. Uh, we're based in Sydney, um, but we spun out of uh, the Credit Swiss uh, Alternatives Group um, almost 14 years ago now. Um, we run uh, basically credit funds for um, large industry funds in Australia, uh, private banking and uh, family offices. Brilliant. Great. And um, Richard, what, what role do you play there? Uh, yeah, I'm the uh, <laughs> the CFO, uh, Chief Investment Officer and Lead Portfolio Manager. And I've been um, managing the Bentham Funds uh, since the inception of the funds. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. And, how, and how do you think um, Bentham is different from, from, the, from your peers? Yeah, I, listen, we're um, very much a boutique investment manager, so we're... Uh, we're very active. Um, we're very active in uh, moving the portfolios around and uh, not just hugging uh, the benchmark environment. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a principal of the business. So I own a third of the business. Uh, we invest in our own funds. Uh, and we're very much uh, looking at it from an Australian investor's point of view. Um, we found that uh, a lot of uh, industry super funds and even uh, you know family offices in Australia benefit from the fact that we're looking at the relative return relative to Australian investors yeah. and also hedging it back into Australia and it tends to be that uh, a lot of our competitors are siloed in a specific part of the market mm -hmm. whereas we tend to go across all different types of markets globally looking for the best relative value for per, per unit of risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess just smiling from my side in, the, in this first part is Asset classes, what 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 do you specialise in specifically? Yeah, we specialise in the fixed interest and credit asset classes. So a lot of people would look at us. If someone was looking to invest in high yield, like say one of the larger industry funds in Australia wanted to invest in high yield and loans, uh, they came to us and gave us you know a five billion dollar mandate to do that. Yeah. So that's the sort of stuff we're seen as specialists in that area, uh, and definitely in credit investments like looking at different credit relative value around the world, that's what we do. Um, it was I spun out of a, a specific group, uh, which was called the Credit Investment Group, that yeah. basically structured credit investments for people, and that's what we've been doing for over 20 years. Great. Fantastic. That, that, was, a, that was a brilliant introduction to, to Bentham and, and your role. Um, maybe we could just dive into, I guess, um, a bit more about the specifics of, of credit and where, where sort of, I guess, corporate bonds sit in the capital structure relative to equity and what does that mean for those securities? Yeah, sure. And uh, listen, I, I suppose the best way to think of a, a capital structure, like we have, in, you know, if you, if you know a, a balance sheet, you have assets and you have liabilities. On the liability side, you have the equity, which is the, um, I, I suppose, the pain money in a... In a, in a structure, then you have debt. And, you know, maybe some of your uh, investors would be familiar with that through their, their business life. So, and, and basically the, uh, the equity is the pain capital. If things go wrong, uh, the equity bears the cost, but I also get the benefit, the upside, the high kicking side. If growth goes well, if income goes well, they get all those benefits. And on the debt side, you have um, debt. And you can have debt from banks and it's more familiar in Australia for we've got a very large banking system we're probably overbanked in Australia um, and then you have the publicly traded debt which is government uh, which is bonds and a corporate bond is basically issued by large companies um, to get term funding for those large companies it's very hard for banks to provide that greater than five years okay. um, and Basically, you know, that's how you make the capital stack on the liability side. The assets are obviously funded by um, that equity uh, and the debt. Mm -hmm. um, and you have different 
priorities in that debt. So, uh, so if a company gets into trouble, um, we've got a legal obligation to be paid our coupons. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a legal obligation to get that. If something goes wrong in the company, the equity um, and a company gets into trouble, the, um, the officers of that company have a legal responsibility to manage the company for the debt, not the equity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of those things that people don't quite get. Australia is very much an equity investor's world. Um, it's probably because that's when superannuation started. It started around those uh, big um, privatisations of Telstra and Commonwealth Bank and the like. But overseas, where capital has been invested for a long time, the corporate debt market has been a very um, populated investment for private investors. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Maybe we could touch on, I guess, some of the securities that, that um, come out of that and, and that you guys invest in. So maybe sort of high yield bonds you touched on and syndicated loans and maybe asset backed securities. Yeah, sure. Um, there's a there's a few things you need to understand when investing in credit investments. Like a, a lot of people, they want to buy one or two yielding assets, and they think they can hold concentration risk. In actual fact, when you're investing for credit, uh, in credit, you need to invest in a very diversified way to diversify the default risk away. Right. Um, so when we're investing in, um, say, uh, high yield bonds or uh, loans it's very important to have a very diversified portfolio and that way you get the yield without um, one default sort of um, taking concentration risk and, and blowing up your portfolio. It tends to be in Australia we don't have a lot of traded debt because we have a, a banking system that crowds out that debt um, until the banking system, the banking system sort of like they, they're a bit like drunken sailors, they either put too much capital to an asset or too little mm -hmm. And right now we're going into a recessionary sort of environment in Australia and that's where the banks are now starting to retreat from different areas. Um, so, But the big thing about uh, high yield bonds and loans is they can give you a very good income, but you need to manage the risk well. We manage the risk well. We've got a lot of credit analysts. Every name in our portfolio has a credit analyst following it. Um, but also they're traded. So you can buy in and out of our funds. And that's actually one of those things that, you know, and the market value changes on a daily basis. So if you think credit looks cheap and, uh, you know, you like a yield, and the yield on loans is currently around 11%, you can invest in an asset that's producing 11% yield in a diversified way that diversifies your risk. And that's sort of the stuff that we do. Um, asset-backed securities, like asset-backed securities are an interesting asset. Like I, I sometimes look at people, um, Sometimes a lot of people, I think, are taking a lot more risk in deposit land than they think. Um, you can invest in an asset-backed security uh, fund, which we, we have an asset-backed securities fund that yields over 6%, and it's very diversified. It's got a, an average rating well above that of a bank, and it's, uh, using, it's being used in some cases to fund banks um, in a super senior way. And so what I mean by that is the credit quality is much better than the credit quality of a bank. Um, so it's, it seems strange to me that people just don't understand those investments exist, but they do exist. Um, a lot of people uh, maybe don't understand the assets and there's a lot of uh, fear around some of those assets because there has been some, uh, you know, some pretty interesting films made about them. Um, but again, I, these there are very highly structured transactions that are quite good because they are structured. It gives the investor more protection, more seniority, and more capital cover than you would get in, say, investing in, uh, or to start with, uh, um, bank debt. Um, and one of the things that we find is a lot of people in Australia actually invest in, say, hybrid securities. Mm. Hybrid security is actually quite a risky asset. Um, while they may get it from the bank, it's very deeply subordinated in a bank. Mm. And in the case of a hybrid security, that, that is probably a, a tier one uh, capital instrument for a bank. So a tier one capital instrument is actually a loss absorbing instrument equal to the equity. So if you're going into a recession like 
that's probably not the best place to do it. Mm. In Australia, they're issued to retail investors. They shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. uh, in the UK, that won't allow them to be issued, as you may know, mm -hmm. um, uh, Camilla. Uh, but in Australia, they issue here, and to be honest, they issue it at, at a credit spread or a yield mm -hmm. that's um, half that of what you can get in publicly traded markets overseas, where you can get liquidity and buy and sell them. Um, so it's 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 quite an unusual market. Mm -hmm. I think the Australian market it suffers from a lack of of these sorts of uh, investments. I think. Um, look, I do, I do want to move on to the, the macro discussion, but just before I do that, I just wanted to ask you, I guess, one more thing about those asset-backed securities. And I guess just to pick up on what you said, you sort of, I guess the way, you, well, my understanding was that, you know, some of those asset-backed securities are, are, are of better credit quality than other securities that yield less. So is it a complexity premium? And are you guys able to, to sort of seize that? Yeah, listen, the, there's no doubt the, the rating is higher. Um, in actual fact, the funny, funny thing is I'm talking at a portfolio construction conference next week. Right. It's quite a popular one. Um, a number of years ago I talked about um, <laughs> I talked about this whole thing because I, you remember the big short, it was about mm. asset-backed securities and, and to be honest there were some really bad ones prior to 2008. There were some really, really bad structures and they were subprime mortgage-backed security structures. They blew up. They were really bad. Mm. They didn't. Uh, they didn't do what was written on the label. Um, post that, uh, these types of things have been really made bulletproof, and so the structures have improved. There's a lot more structural uh, support in them, and they've performed really well. And the ones that we've invested in have actually performed right through that 2008 period. Right. But they traded off as at, at, at a discount. Um, I do think there's a complexity premium. Um, there is this basketing of risk together, but you do need to be able to analyse them. Like mm. we, we pay for the systems to analyse these things. It costs us um, for one system, and there's a licence. It pay, costs us quarter of a quarter of a million US a year to pay f just for the licence wow. to use the data system that we use to analyse these things. Um, but yeah, there is a complexity in them, but. Um, for large investors, and we're talking banks and insurance companies, they're investing in these assets because they're good. We're actually uh, pretty good at uh, reviewing these structures and monitoring them on a, 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 a daily basis. Um, so yeah, I think there's a little bit of a complexity premium, but I, I actually don't think it should be. Mm. Like it's one of those assets where I think corporate bonds sometimes trade too expensive, they don't give you enough yield. And these uh, asset-backed securities sometimes trade too wide and they uh, give you too much yield for the risk you're taking on. Um, so it's an interesting an interesting space. Uh, listen, again, we've, you know, we obviously have a long track record of investing in those structures. We know how the structures are made. Um, we deconstruct them. We actually can analyse them. And it's not just, you can't just buy a credit and because it has a rating its handle, just sit with that credit. Mm. You have to monitor the remittances from these instruments, understand how the cash flow waterfalls for occur. Mm. Um, but you know there is an opportunity there. I, I think the I think uh, asset backed securities are a safer investment than Australian fixed interest with government bonds. To be honest, but you get a better yield, mm -hmm. um, uh, you get le a little less interest rate risk. Um, and you're not suffering to the varies of uh, different governments and mm. and different corporate actions, if you know what I mean. Brilliant, brilliant. That, that was fantastic. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Um, look, ma maybe we will move on to the macro. I know macro is a big part of what what you guys do at, at Bentham, and you sort of touched on it earlier. Maybe we could start with, I guess, how you guys do incorporate macro into into your investing process. Yeah, sure. I, I, listen, I. I think uh, there are key themes that come across in uh, macro investing, especially in uh, rates and credit investment. They're the two drivers of investment returns in the fixed interest space, you know, uh, interest rate risk and, uh, and credit risk. Uh, and we go through different uh, economic cycles and basically we always look at the relative value in these different markets all around the world. 
Um, so yeah, we see it as a, a top-down way of uh, improving our allocation in creating portfolios. So that's how we utilise it. And sometimes it identifies an asset that's you know much maligned. Uh, sometimes it identifies that you don't want to be in an asset. Like last year, you didn't want to be in fixed interest. We actually shorted fixed interest and made money by shorting interest rates. Right now, I don't think you want to do that anymore. I think you, you want to have long interest rate risk in your portfolio. Um, but again, uh, that's how we utilise it. And we review uh, the potential returns of all the different assets available. And we review that on a monthly basis and on a quarterly basis we do, um, we do actual forecast potential returns in a number of different markets we do. Um, for anyone that's mathematical in the room, so we do closed models for one, two, and three year returns, and we do it in like four different scenarios, and one of those would include a depression scenario, mm -hmm. which no one really wants to hear, but no. you've always <laughs> got to see what those, those drawdowns can be. Um, and again, uh, yeah, we do think top down is useful. Um, we don't think it should always dominate a portfolio. At the end of the day, you need to buy, and we produce income for people, and we do produce recurring income for people. Mm -hmm. And right now, I think that recurring income is quite high. Um, and you know, we always have to invest, so what are we investing? Mm -hmm. And so we have to invest in something to produce that recurring income. So we try and uh, invest in things that uh, we think um, firstly, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll appreciate in value, so the credit spread will contract, which will give us a capital gain-ish. Um, and then also, you know, we, we don't want to lose money, so it's, um, we want to make sure that we don't have too much risk where we'll lose money. Defaults are one of those things I, we can talk about it at, down the track, but um, I, I think that some people actually say, well, we're so good we never have defaults. And I, like, I think anyone investing in non-investment grade world that's not true. Like you can buy and sell assets before they default mm. and they're a, a distressed pricing. That's as if they've defaulted. Um, we just don't see it that way. We think you can um, you diversify your risk and then you can buy or sell where you see the potential return in that asset. And, and even, and, and I think the thing that even in defaults, um, debt assets will repay you a lot of money and you can sometimes see debt trade down. Um, there are some assets that currently are trading 10 cents in the dollar that, to be honest, should be trading at <laughs> 10 cents in the dollar because they're that bad. Right. Um, and it's some of the uh, Chinese construction and development companies are those mm. sort of companies. Um, but there are other companies that trade at a discount because they're out of favour. Um, they've got good value in the business or maybe they're just a business that needs to delever. Um, deleveraging is possible to achieve. It's not necessarily great for the equity, mm. Mm. but it's usually really good for the debt. Right, okay. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, maybe we can just move now on to, I guess, a, a discussion about your outlook. Um, so we're recording this on, on the 16th of February. We had the US inflation numbers out for January. They were broadly in line with expectations, but I think the 0.5 on the headline was the highest going back to the middle of last year. So I think we, we saw a rally in sort of uh, the back back end of last year and in January this year in particular on hopes that we were going to be entering a disinflation environment, that the soft landing was, the, the chances of the soft landing were increasing. Um, where, where are we today, Richard? Yeah, listen, we, we've actually done a webcast ourselves on, uh, we're calling it Airport 2023, mm -hmm. what's the landing going to be like? Yeah, right. And, uh, <laughs> and before Jerome, Jerome Powell came out, we said bumpy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think it's going to be different for different environments, right? So uh, I think we have reached a peak in inflation in the US. So the peak's in. Yep. Now it's how volatile that inflation number is going to be. I do think um, for certain reasons this... Uh, number in January, uh, there's a lot of annual reviews of salaries in January and so there's a pop in people's income mm. even when they've had inflation. Mm. So that's also why there was a strong okay. um, retail number last night. Yep. I, d I yep. actually don't think, th those are not numbers that I think are going to dominate, I think they'll both fade. Okay. I think inflation mm. is coming down. Now the real question is how quickly will we get into that band of 2 to 3%? I just don't think we'll get there this year. Okay. And so, so I think uh, central banks will be 
uh, Volker esque. Yep. So they'll be uh, channeling uh, Paul Volcker, the, mm -hmm. the famous central banker. Mm -hmm. Now, he's famous for creating a really bad recession. <laughs> um, uh, so, I, I, again, we've got to be a little bit careful here. But, again, um, that's not bad for fixed interest investors because I think interest rates being higher will mean, you know, a higher, higher, higher rate of return longer term. Um, but what it does mean is that I think we will see a higher cash rate. But fixed interest markets look very long term. They don't just look at the cash rate for the next six months, the next one year. You know, we look out 10 years, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, five year numbers, like, you know, when we can lend money, when we can use, a, when, they've, when they're putting forward a, an average cash rate at uh, four and a half, um, in the interest rate swap market, that's saying that cash will average four and a half for the next five years. That's not going to happen. Mm. I think we'll see interest rates get up above four in Australia and then start to come down. They'll get above five in the US and above five in New Zealand, and then they'll come down. But right now, I think people are afraid that the consumer hasn't got the message and the central banks have been this demand buster um, so they're, they're trying to bust demand because that's the only way they can make things work and bring inflation down so we've had a supply shock which is you know supply demand curve sort of work very normally in, in all markets so the only way they can bring down inflation is by decreasing demand and I think, still think they're on that mode of doing that Okay. So do you, you think the, I guess, the inversion of the, the US yield curve, that, is that signalling that, you know, we're guaranteed a recession? Or is that signalling that inflation is going to drop away, growth will weaken and, and central banks can ease rates? What's your, what's your view there? Listen, there's no doubt um, that the inversion of the yield curve is telling you one thing, it's that interest rates are getting higher than the economy may be able to stand mm. now uh, they're not high historically but we've got to understand that with interest rates near zero for a long time people increase their debt load mm. and companies increase their debt load and uh, corporations increase their debt load and what that actually means is that there's some deleveraging to occur and deleveraging is generally not good for growth which is sort of equity is the way I would look at it. Now, whether we get a recession or not, that's, I, I think that's a really interesting discussion because I think we'll get recessions in different countries. Mm -hmm. Countries that are very sensitive to rising short-term interest rates most likely will have recessions. I would include New Zealand, Australia, Canada and the UK in those areas. Uh, I think the US is much less vulnerable to this. Now, the reason it's much less vulnerable is in the US, a lot of people can borrow 30 years fixed on their mortgage. So a lot of people, literally in the US, the average repricing of mortgages every f is, is, it won't reprice for 15 years. So in actual fact, they've locked in their mortgage rate for two and a bit percent mm. for the next 15 years. Oh. Now, they're probably not going to move house, because they yeah. <laughs> but um, they're not under the same stress that, say, an Australian mm. household is mm. that's gone from paying 2.5% on their mortgage to now 65 and, you know, possibly 7 So it's So uh, different economies will have different recessions this time around. Last time, you know, in 2008, the big recession was in the US. Um, unfortunately, I think, you know, we may be learning the R word here. Yeah, OK. What about, I guess... Um terminal rates for central banks are they are you seeing any risk that they really do take off i mean i think i saw something at the back end of last week about some traders buying options on on six percent fed funds rate and sort of caused a bit of a stir so yeah do, do you see a chance that rates really have to go much higher than markets are expecting today i listen i i think it's less likely um last year when interest rates were <laughs> close to zero uh, we bought a lot of uh, options on interest rates going past two and three percent. Great trade, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent trade. Yeah. It's like, you know, 
quite proud of the trade. Mm. Yeah. Um, and we and we also shorted outright um, interest rates. Now, at those low levels, it was more likely. Mm. Now, the, the fear is right now that, and there is a reasonable fear um, that we've got close to full employment um, and they're rising interest rates. And if you look at the retail sales numbers last night, demand is not coming off. Mm. Now, I, you know, I, I think that I've got some sympathy that interest rates will be a little bit higher than people expect. I think even, you know, my 4% or 4.25% in Australia is a higher interest rate than most people expect. Mm. I mean, to be honest, they weren't expecting uh, 2% last year, well, this yeah, time last yeah, yeah. year. So, um, but I think if it goes much higher, the economy can't stand it. When I first started in markets, it was always, we always talked about the long and variable lag. Mm. Yep. Now, the long and variable lag was in interest rates. We haven't actually had interest rates rising for that long. It feels like it, it's been quite consistent, but they've moved very quickly. And they've moved three times as, they've moved three times as much, three times as fast. And we haven't seen the lag effect come through. Now, the average mortgage in Australia reprices every 1.4 years. And that's because we've got some fixed rate. Yeah. So we probably won't see the real impact for this until uh, we sort of get into September this year. Okay. And that's when all the repricing will come through. Mm -hmm. And some people are going from a you know 2.5% interest rate to now a 6% interest mm -hmm. rate. That's a big change. Some people's payments, and I've heard from New Zealand, New Zealand's even going higher on interest rates. People are seeing their mortgage payment double. Mm. Now, mortgage payment double, I don't think people's incomes are doubling. Mm. Um, so that's actually going to knock into their discretionary uh, income. And so they're not going to be able to spend much. And, and, and they may, and it's actually going to put pressure on some of the banks for the housing, because mm. a lot of these things, because the interest rates have gone up, at the current rates, most banks wouldn't lend as much to people. So in actual fact, there's less borrowing capacity. So if you look at the, for the change in interest rates, there's about 35% less borrowing capacity. So that means, you know, literally housing prices can fall to match that. Um, and that would have a, a sort of like a circular loop. The fall in housing prices has an effect on people's uh, feeling of wealth. Mm. And that wealth effect means people will spend a little less, which means there'll be less consumption, mm -hmm. which means inflation comes down. So it, it, it all works. Uh, it just doesn't work in timing that people feel currently. I, I don't think a lot of people have experience with rising interest rates, um, mm. one. I've had experience, I'm very fortunate that at the start of my career doing that, but obviously I've been doing credit for over 20 years now. Mm. Um, but I've also had experience in recessions offshore. Um, you know, I think these things happen and sometimes they look like uh, they're a train wreck happening in slow motion. Mm. And sometimes and I think that's sort of the way it looks like now. I think a lot of people are not as financially savvy um, so while I have been worried about this for, for two years, most people are now starting to get quite worried about, you know, the real impact on their disposable income and how it's going to knock on to property. Mm. And then I think there's also all the, all the stuff post-COVID that's going to come through and affect people. I think a lot of people have actually gone outside and bought properties outside in peripheral areas. Mm. And maybe that's going to be risky mm -hmm. uh, as people come back in. I think a lot of people have been working outside the office uh, when there's a shortage of labour and uh, uh, unemployment rates going down. Um, basically, bosses have to put up with whatever happens mm. uh, as the labour market gets um, less tight. Mm -hmm. um, maybe unemployment starts to rise and people start to say, I want you in the office more full time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having those places outside the city won't be as attractive, I think. Um, but again, that's a totally different area. Brilliant. We're sort of jumping around a little bit here, but I guess housing, I mean, I sort of got sent something yesterday saying that um, authorities are considering lowering that that interest buffer that banks have to consider when they when they assess borrowers. Um, I mean, 
potentially that will that will see some recovery in house prices. Do you have a sort of, I guess, a, a personal view on on house prices in Australia? I mean, is it a good thing that they could come down and oh, people can afford them? Or? Totally, totally, yeah, it's yeah. a good thing. It's, I, listen, I think uh, unfortunately, though, I think there's a certain age bracket that is extended to get into the house that they feel they deserve, mm. and they borrow a lot. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, we borrow floating in Australia, mm. um, and that's going to reprice. So that's that, it's just natural to me that there's uh, a fall off uh, in housing prices right now as interest rates rise. Will that be forever? Well, it depends how much immigration we have. It depends the, what the supply of markets are. It also depends how people rotate out of that. There, there is a third of the market which is, I think, going to be under stress. There is a third that will be okay. And then there's a third that doesn't have any mortgage at yeah. all, and probably a lot of your investors, and they're not going to have many problems at all with this. Mm. Um, I, I have heard that a lot of people are having trouble passing on as much of the increase in interest rates on their um, investment property. Like, you know, that mass, may mean that investment properties come under pressure. Mm. Mm. Um, again, that borrowing capacity, as that decreases, like a pe- I, I think we forget sometimes what housing is. Housing is a consumption item that we use to uh, enjoy our lives, right? Um, if we can afford to borrow for a certain lifestyle and we, it's within our means, we'll do it. But with this change in interest rates, um, our lifestyle is going to be curtailed a bit. Mm-hmm. And that's the, 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 that's the purpose of that rising interest rates. Now, I don't think interest rates are terribly high which is even more concerning. Like, you know, it, it means that I think we just have too much leverage in the system. Um, and that has to be alleviated slowly. I think a lot of parents are going to be tapped on the shoulder to help <laughs> out. Um, you know, that's just the way it's going to be uh, for a little while. I don't think interest rates are terribly high. Now, the risk, as you mentioned earlier, the risk is that um, inflation doesn't get contained and that it pops up. But I, I do believe that you know, we'll worry about that now, and we'll worry. And, and we, you know, one of the reasons we're not worrying about it so much is there is a very warm winter in Europe. Mm. Mm. If there's a cold snap that comes through Europe towards the end of this year, the the conflict is still going on in Ukraine. Energy prices could jump, mm. and then I think we we could have a pretty nasty situation, and then that would mean a more globalised recession. Um, I wish I could be a happy person. I was listening. Yields are higher. Yields are higher. Yields are higher. Better, better returns. Better returns. Yields are higher. I, I mean, but in recessionary environments, you'll see more defaults, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and and again, like the one, the only thing I will we'll say on the default thing is like you know, diversify your risk. Like mm-hmm. if you diversify your risk, you defaults won't be such a bad thing. We always see defaults as that, that sort of environment, the environment where we love, because there's lots of opportunities because credit spreads widen. And it gives us a great opportunity to deliver superior returns to investors. Mm. Um, but that being said, like, you know, this is, I, I think, you know, it's going to be the bumpy landing. Maybe it's softer mm. um, because employment is, uh, unemployment is so low. Mm. Um, but I, I, I don't really know that you can go from such a high growth environment mm. to a low growth environment. Um, it's sort of like a very steep dive into a land on a very short runway of two to three percent inflation. I just think it's really difficult. Mm. So I can't help but think there's going to be mistakes that are made that won't be on purpose. Um, you know, you know the, the current ABA governor's uh, talking uh, was talking to the Senate yesterday, talking to the, um, the House of Representatives tomorrow. Uh, again, he feels uh, put upon. Mm. Um, the reality is that's his job. He's got to mm. increase interest rates when people don't want them increased. Mm. Everyone's going to dislike him and probably be the scapegoat. Um, that's the way it is. So that actually leads perfectly into probably what will be my final question. So I'm going to put you on the spot here, I guess. If, if Lowe does get the, the flick, which has sort of been a bit of a rumour, um, say you were appointed to the head of the RBA. Oh, <laughs> gosh. My what, what would you job. be thinking? Would you be thinking, you know, we've already done a lot in, in a pretty short amount of time. Let's just sit on our hands for a while and see, because as you said, there is a varying lag. Or do you think keep going until you really see inflation snuffed out and then 
almost think, well, we can cut really quick like we did in COVID and, and, and get things going again? Oh, listen, I think that cut rate's too low originally, so I would have been hated because I didn't cut rates low enough. And in COVID? Uh, in COVID, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think they put mm. rates too low. They didn't go negative, which is good. Um, sorry, this is a sorry, this is a fantasy thing. Firstly, <laughs> firstly, I, firstly, I wouldn't be paid enough, <laughs> even though he's really well paid. He, he makes a lot he, for a government employee. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a public servant. Like I don't see myself as being a public servant. Mm -hmm. um, I've always had the fantasy that I would, uh, that if I was, if I had that role, what, I, what would I do? Mm. Well, it depends, right? Mm. So I would be less likely to be influenced by government. Mm. Like I know that the last government was on the phone to him every day. Really? Mm. Mm. Wow. And, and I'm sure this one is too. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a there's a deal with the government right now. If the government doesn't push for, you know, basically, the Labor Party went to the election saying they wanted real wage growth, real wage growth basically means mm. you want wage growth above inflation. Mm. Now, if they push for that right now, the RBA is going to have to take rates a lot higher. Mm. Okay, so I think there's already a deal in the place between those guys to do something, to do less. Um, and I think it's likely that the Labor government's going to have to face a recession. Yep. Uh, so I think they want to make a low scapegoat. Yeah. Uh, I got a pretty good idea they wouldn't be tapping me on the shoulder <laughs> for the job. I mean, firstly, I don't have a PhD in the economics from MIT. Well, you that just seems to be a well. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> again, I, you know, they could always pay me more. Um, but but I, I would actually be waiting a little bit. Okay. I would be waiting a little bit. I, I'm, listen, the, the comparative for us to watch someone that's not waiting mm -hmm. is to watch uh, the. Uh, uh, Reserve Bank Governor in New Zealand, who's uh, Mr. Orr, mm -hmm. and we call him Shock and Orr. <laughs> um, he is actually going to raise interest rates yeah. above five percent, mm. and we can see what will happen there, and relative to what will happen here, I think I think they'll be a bit more contained here, but but we have to be like you know that sensitivity to interest rate increases and the and like you know to work back from it, it is going to cause pain mm -hmm. and. The pain that's going to be caused is young families with two kids mm -hmm. that now have one income. You know, they're going to have to have two incomes. Like there's, you know, childcare is going to be a big issue in here. There's all these sorts of things. There's a, there's a knock-on effect of higher interest rates. Now, do I think interest rates should come down a lot afterwards? No, I don't. I actually think interest rates were too low for too long. Uh, it wasn't good for retirees. It made mm. retirees grab for crazy income like i'm sure some people even went into crypto and mm. stuff like that again uh, at a moderate moderate rate it stops people having too much leverage um again so i would be more conservative keeping things a bit more constant probably around four percent and then i would probably i probably would drop interest rates if there was a recession probably down to about one and a half percent not Point one, mm -hmm. yeah, right. like I just think to point one was just crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, what else would I do? Oh, I'd do lots of things. I'd probably put a, a variable GST in place um, because that's a better way to decrease consumption. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, but I wouldn't be able to do that because that's a political thing. So <laughs> the politicians would have to take responsibility, which they're never going to do. And I mean, the thing that really annoys me, like I wish politicians, I wish we had politicians that worked in a company or manage the company so they understand mm -hmm. the difficulties that people have gone through. I really feel for small business that have gone through a really, a real roller coaster ride in the last few years mm -hmm. and to come out of this and then have rising interest rates, it must be gutting. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think it's one of those things, you, you know, and I do think um, the current Reserve Bank Governor and the board like the, the Reserve Bank Governor, I think he's a, um, I think he's always worked at the Reserve Bank. I don't think he's ever worked anywhere else since he left school. Mm. Um, I think people should have a broader skill set, mm. um, and uh, you know, basically talk more broadly. Like I think there's a very specific group of people that get to talk to the Reserve Bank Governor. Mm. I think it should be, but but again, it shouldn't be just all from one guy. I reckon. You know, I definitely think he's going to be the full guy for this recession. Whether they, 
they may they may like uh, having him as the uh, scapegoat and keep him around just for that purpose. Yeah, right. So, uh, you know, yeah. just so they can keep on pointing at him. But I, I, again, I don't think it should be the major driving point. Like, I think there'll be... Um, and I, I do think that you'll see a supply response to this um, uh, cost shock in energy. Okay. I do think you're going to see a lot more renew- renewables. Storage on renewables is a big issue. I think nuclear power is back on the mm-hmm. drawing table, which it should be. Um, and I do think that's uh, longer term, that'll mean oil prices won't be as attractive mm-hmm. longer term. But medium term, we don't have a solution. Mm-hmm. So we're going there. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's. I think we have this bumpy cycle. Um, to be honest, I love uh, any volatility in markets because it gives opportunities to outperform. Um, and I wouldn't be dead for quits because I think it's going to be so interesting to see how this all ends up. Mm. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. Right. We'll, uh, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much, Richard. No worries. Well, thanks a lot for your time. And uh, again, uh, I love what you guys are doing here. It's great. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Cheers.